And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. <laughs> The Eternal Light, the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's program, Photographer in Buckskin, was written by Mark Siegel and is presented in observance of Thanksgiving. Between the great oceans, the continent lies broad and beautiful. The rivers wind through the peaceful land, providing sustenance, and the mountains reach upward toward the absolute. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. To this land they came, the sons of many nations, seeking a sign of his presence and the brisk air of freedom. For two hundred years, slowly, Painfully, they pushed across the continent. And as they stood before the wonders of his hands, first on the stormy seacoast fringe, then in the plains and mountains, in a thousand places, men sensed with awe the presence of their maker. In the year 1854, high on a hill crest in Utah, a gaunt figure in tattered buckskin stood beneath the open sky, and seeing the tiny Mormon settlement nestled in the valley below, lifted his head like so many before him, and offered up a prayer of thanksgiving. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who has kept us in life and preserved us unto this day. Yes, a prayer of thanksgiving. His name was Solomon Nunez Carvalho, son of a family of rabbis, teachers, and writers. And this is his story an obscure but heroic chapter in the unfolding drama of America. I left New York on September 5, 1853. My purpose, to join Colonel John Charles Fremont in his expedition through the western wilderness. I reached St. Louis a few days behind schedule, and though it was midnight repaired immediately to the home of Colonel Fremont. Ah, Mr. Cavallo, at last. My respects, Colonel Fremont, and my apologies. Uh, transportation is not exactly modern in these parts. <laughs> You'll revise your standards on that score in the next few months, Mr. Cavallo. But come in. We've been waiting up for you. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Solomon Cavallo, who is to be our official photographer. Mr. Cavallo, this is Mr. Eglifstein, our topographer. How do you do, How do sir? you do, Mr. Cavallo? And Mr. Fuller, our engineer. I'm pleased to make your Hello. acquaintance, sir. Have you been in the Plains country before, Mr. Cavallo? I know, Mr. Eglifstein. This is my first trip west. Then I take it you have photographed the mountains of the east. Oh, no, no. I've lived all my life in the cities. <laughs> You won't find the wilderness much like New York or Philadelphia. I don't expect so What Mr. Eglifstein is trying to say, Mr. Cavallo, is that you're free to withdraw from the expedition. Withdraw? Why should I withdraw? Both Mr. Eglifstein and Mr. Fuller of the opinion that successful photography cannot be accomplished under the conditions we will face. But I considered those conditions when we discussed the expedition in New York. You don't understand, Mr. Caballo. How can you buff or coat photographic plates in the snow? Mr. Fuller, I gave Colonel Fremont my word in New York that I could. I do not give my word lightly. Mr. Cavallo, neither Mr. Fuller nor Mr. Eglifstein question your integrity, nor do I. Well, then why is the question raised? I'll be frank with you. When you agreed to serve as photographer to the expedition, I, too, had some qualms. As to my professional ability? Not at all. As to your ability to withstand the rigors of the journey. Well, then why did you invite me to join you, Colonel? Endurance is as much a matter of spirit as physique. I felt you were a man of spirit. And now? Obviously, I was right. 
I don't consider myself a bad judge of men, Mr. Cavallo. I promise you, sir, you will not regret your judgment. No. No, I don't think I will. Let us consider the matter settled. Good. Now then, to return to our business. You will leave for Kansas tomorrow and set up camp. Mr. Eglipstein will be in charge. I will join you within the week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Cavallo, I hope you understand we meant no offense. Oh, I understand, Mr. Eglipstein. And if I may make a suggestion... Yes? Between now and tomorrow, get some buckskin clothes and moccasins, top hats and broadcloth coats are not the best apparel for the western wilderness. I traded my boots for moccasins and my broadcloth for buckskin. And the very next day stood at the railing of the steamboat with Eglofstein, watching as St. Louis and civilization receded. Don't look back, Cavallo. Look forward. What? I'm sorry, Eglofstein. This is a uh, new experience for me. You were thinking of home? Of my wife and family. How'd you know? <laughs> when I was younger, I did too. Always. You've uh, been into the wilderness before, haven't you? Three times with Colonel Fremont, but never into the Rockies, never in the winter. Well, you sound almost afraid. Afraid? Oh, I'm not afraid. What's it like, Eglofstein? The country? Beautiful, Cavallo. Well, wild, untamed. Ah, uh, good. We'll make wonderful photographs. If the elements allow it. There, you said it again. Haven't you any confidence, Eglofstein? Confidence is an important attribute, Cavallo, but there's another equally important in the wilderness. For survival? For survival and for peace of mind. And uh, what would it be, Eglofstein? Humility, my son. Humility. <laughs> We set up camp at Westport, where final preparations were to be made while we awaited Colonel Fremont. Our party consisted of 22 people. Two were Mexican guides, ten were Delaware Indians. Among them were Luchas, one that took to train me in the ways of the plains. Pongo ready. Uh, what's that, Luchas? Uh, pongo ready. Much good uh, buffalo pongo. Pongo. Uh, what's a pongo? Follow Luchas, see. Pongo. You learn right, Pongo. Good. Within the week, I learned to ride the buffalo pony well. Under Oliver Fuller's direction, I tried to learn other things as well. Hold it straight before you, Cavallo. Like this? No, at arm's length. Now, try again. And fire the shot in succession. Cavallo, you, uh, you have a wonderful eye. Thank you. For a photographer, not a marksman. If you want my advice... Yes? Do your shooting with your camera, not your revolver. We stayed in camp at Westport several weeks longer than we had planned to. Colonel Fremont had taken ill in St. Louis... It was early November before he rejoined us, and there was little time to waste. Mr. Fuller, is everything in readiness? Yes, Colonel. How many mules have you purchased? Fifty, sir. Of good stock, I hope. The best. They better be. The entire expedition depends on them. I know it, sir. Mr. Eglifstein. Yes, Colonel? We've lost almost two months. Do you believe we can endure the crossing of the Rockies? It will be difficult, I sir. know it will be difficult. I'm asking if you think we can get across. Yes, sir, I do. With one exception, we have all had experience in hardship. You refer to Mr. Cavallo? Yes, sir. Well, Cavallo, I gave you your choice. We will send excess baggage back to Independence tomorrow. If you wish, you may accompany us. Well, I gave you my word, Colonel. You don't seem to understand. 
This may be a question of your life. Oh, I understand it very well, sir. Think I've... it over. Let me know in the morning. Not so simple a decision to make. That night I tossed and turned. At dawn, still torn between thoughts of my family and the pledge I had given Colonel Fremont to accompany him, I was up. I saddled my buffalo pony and rode out from the camp a few miles to make my decision in solitude. Above me, the arched vault of heaven stretched to infinity. And at my feet, the undulating grass, stretching as far as the eye could see, seemed to carry my thoughts upon its rolling surface far, far into an impenetrable future. You cannot know what it is like to stand in a place, seeing no human being, alone, yet not alone. For all around me, in every tree and every flower, life, unceasing eternal life was evident. I sat thus, perhaps, for fifteen minutes, my heart beating anxiously, yet with a strange serenity. And then, galloping towards me, I saw Eglofstein. His wise old face turned to the luminous sky. I heard you leave. I thought you might want to talk to someone. Perhaps to someone older. You're very kind, Eglofstein. Friendships are made quickly beneath the open sky, Cavallo. Yes, that's true. But why? Oh, a sense of insignificance, perhaps? Eglofstein, I... I think I understand what you meant. About humility. Ah, I knew you would. And it has helped me make up my mind. You will return to independence? No, I will go forward with you. I am confident that the great spirit who shows himself in all this natural wonder will also protect me in the trials ahead. We started the long trek, the mule train stretching out before us towards the western horizon. From Westport to Smoky Hills, from Smoky Hills to Walnut Creek, up the Arkansas River, across the Great Divide. Each day I made pictures, seeking to capture on the photographic plates some of the wonder and majesty of God's work. On, on, into the Huerfano Valley, through Sand Hill Pass, into the San Luis Valley, across the Rio Grande del Norte, into a country never before explored. Always, whatever the obstacles, I made pictures. Up this way, Cavallo. I have a footfall. Coming, Eglostein. Careful now. The camera, hand it up. Uh. Now the tripod and the chemicals. All right. There. Now, you. Uh, ah, thank you, Aglostein. I, oh, I couldn't have made it without you. Oh, I without you, son. I never met a man who tried as hard as you do. Look. Look at it. Mm. Magnificent. But we'll freeze to death if I don't get a fire going here. How far is it to the next range, Eglofstein? Oh, Fifty miles, maybe sixty. I can hardly wait to get there. Take your pictures, Cavallo. Here, uh, a man feels more of heaven than of earth, Eglofstein. He does. But, Dave uh, Cavallo, take your pictures and let us get down. If we stay much longer in this cold, we may find ourselves more of heaven than of earth permanently. In 
In early December, we had our first snow. On the summits of the mountains, I stood waist-high in snow, photographing panoramas of the land. And in the valleys, we slugged along in the mud. Down the side of one range, up the side of the next. The day it happened, we were making our way up a narrow ledge high above a canyon. Oliver Fuller was with me. Careful, Carvalho. I'm right with you, Fuller. Oh, yesterday snow and now this. It'd be hard to keep our footing. More than hard, Carvalho. Dangerous. Fuller. Oliver Fuller. Coming, Colonel Fremont. Fuller. Fuller, this is impossible. Can you turn this mule train around? Not on this trail, sir. It's too narrow. We can't stay here. The animals are getting restless. If one slips, we lose the entire mule train. I know, Colonel, but we have no choice, sir. And we'd better push on. I'll lead the way. Yes, sir. Will it just stay with the lead mule? Carvalho and Egglestein will take the middle and I'll bring up the rear, sir. Good enough. Let us proceed with caution. Yes, sir. Ready? Oh! made our way up the muddy side of the mountain through a sheet of driving rain. At our left, solid granite. To the right, the dizzying canyon below, yawning, waiting. Suddenly, the lead mule took fight. What's that mule? Hold him, he's slipping. Eglerstein, cut the traces. The lead mules are sliding into the canyon. Carvalho, I congratulate you on your cool-headedness. Thank you, Colonel. But I cannot hide the seriousness of our situation from any of you. We've recovered some of our provisions, Colonel. Yes, yes, food for a few days, Fuller. That's really all that's left. We'll find game, Colonel. Game is scarce in these mountains. As you know it. Our Indians are good hunters, sir. Our ammunition is at the bottom of the canyon, Eglifstein. Well, I have some ammunition, Colonel. For a rifle... Oh, no, sir, in my revolver. A revolver isn't the best weapon for hunting, Cavallo. Gentlemen, we had better face the facts. Colonel. Yes, Eglifstein? There's no need to state the facts. Uh, all of us recognize them. Yes, I suppose you're right. I ask only one thing of you. We're listening, Colonel. It is possible we will not get out of these mountains alive. Yet, if we are to die... Yes. Let us die together, helping each other like men. Eat it, Cabrera. It will give you strength. I can't, I must. I must. But eat it. It's not the first time a man has had to eat his own horse. To stay alive. Lean on me, Fuller. It's no use, Carvalho. You can make it. You have to make it. Not with this frozen foot, Carvalho. Please leave me. You'll lose the others. Fuller, get on my back. I can lose the others. But I cannot lose myself. Five weeks we wandered in the snowbound Rockies, slaughtering one and listening to Stan westwards, always towards our only hope. And then one morning, Wolucius awakened Colonel Fremont with unusual haste. Colonel? Huh? Colonel? <clears throat> what is it, Wolucius? For the love of heaven, stop shaking me! Indians. What tribe? Utes. In warping. Utes? Where? Standing in circle around camp. How many? As the fingers of ten men. Wolucius is a good guard. Cavallo, Eglifstein. What is it, Colonel? Wolucius says we're surrounded by Utes. Perhaps a hundred braves. We heard Utes. That is not good. They come. Yes. They can I see them, Wolucius? Everyone up. 
Let us stay together. The Indians approached silently and stood in a group before us. The leader began making sign language to Luchas. Look at them, Cavallo. The poor devils look as hungry as we do. What is he saying to Luchas, Eglostein? He seems angry. He's saying the white man does not belong in the mountains. What will happen, Eglostein? The worst, Cavallo. Unless we can convince them we are powerful. That we are powerful? That it would be unwise for them to hurt us. Cavallo, where are you going? Well, Luchas, tell the chief we do not wish to hurt him or his people. I have told the chief. Tell the chief we have great magic. Chief asks, what magic? Tell him to place his tomahawk in the snow at a hundred paces, and I will show him. Eglstein, what does Cavallo think he's doing? He's taking his revolver from his holster. Now tell the chief I will make splinters in his tomahawk. I have told him. Chief says you not have bow and arrow. Tell him there will be a sound as of thunder. Luchas understand. Luchas has told him. Good. And now may the Lord be with me. Cavallo, you've done it. They're going away. When did you learn to shoot like that, Cavallo? Your hand was as a hunter's. It wasn't my hand that held the revolver, Eglofstein. It was the hand of the one above. Almost two weeks more we wandered. Oliver Fuller, our friend and comrade Fuller, went off into the snow rather than be a burden on the party. When it seemed that we could go no further, Colonel Fremont summoned me to the tiny fire we had built to warm our numbed hands and feet. Cavallo, I've about given up. Colonel Fremont, I beg of you, do not say that. I feel I can, to you. Somehow you've proved stronger than any one of us. Cavallo, we have only one chance of getting out of these mountains. Only one hope. I'm ready for whatever you wish of me, Colonel. By my reckoning, by what observations I've been able to make, and by Eglifstein's best guess, we're only a few days from the Mormon settlement of Parowan. Well, then let us push on. We don't know in which direction. But from a suitable vantage point, perhaps we could see some trace of civilization. Suitable vantage point? You mean that peak? Yes. If we could make it to the top. I'm ready to try with you, Colonel. Oh, I doubt, I doubt very much we can make it, Cavallo. Not in our weakened condition. Well, it's better to try and fail, perhaps. No, Colonel, for certain. I have learned two lessons on this journey, Colonel. Eglofstein taught them to me early. And what are they, Cavallo? To be humble. And to look forward. Not back. Up. 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 Through the glaring day and the black night... To our armpits in snow, scratching for the prickles of cactus leaves to support our failing strength. And finally, on the third day, Colonel Fremont and I reached the ice-capped summit of the great mountain. Oh, no! Cavallo! No! Before us lay not open country, as we had hoped, as we had expected, but more snow-capped mountains. Stretching as far as our vision carried. We're lost now, Cavallo. Totally and finally lost. While we're still alive, we are not lost. In the face of this, how can you remain so confident, man? Look at the face of the earth before you. Do you believe you can survive in this? It is the face of the earth that makes me know I will survive, Colonel. I do not understand. What is revealed in this grandeur? Is it not God's will? 
Are these mountains not God's creation? I don't question that. Well, then let us trust that he will deliver us. I envy your faith, Cavallo. Do not envy it, Colonel Fremont. Share it. It's not so easy. There is a psalm that will help, Colonel. The 108th, do you know it? I think not. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Soon after our return to camp, digging weakly for food, I felt something beneath the snow. What? Kavala, what is it? What is it? Edgarstein, feel this. Feel it. This rut? Not just a rut, Edgarstein. The rut of a wagon wheel. We found a road back to life. Three days later, we stood on the crest of a hill in Utah. This time in sunshine. Below, the smoke rose peacefully from the little settlement of Parowan. We bared our heads and offered up thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for deliverance and for the great good land. Colonel Fremont, whose ancestors had trod the soil of France. Egloffstein, born and schooled in Germany. And I the son of Spanish Jews who fled to this new world in search of freedom and a new life. And knowing that we were saved, we three, saved also by the sacrifice of Fuller and American, and by the devotion of our Indian and Mexican guides, I offered up another prayer in my heart as well. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. If you would like a copy of today's script, please send your name and address with 10 cents to cover the cost of postage and handling to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. Our eternal light drama today, Photographer in Buckskin, was written by Mark Siegel and was presented in observance of Thanksgiving. Cantor David Putterman sang the liturgical introduction. Featured in the cast were Bill Lipton, Guy Rep, Roger DeCoven, Sam Gray, Maurice Chaplin, and Norman Rose. This is Mel Brandt. Our program was directed by George Wutzos. This weekly program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary, of America. This is the NBC Radio Network.